The Caribbean can without a doubt be described as the most African place in the world outside of the actual continent of Africa. As I've discussed before, because of colonial and modern intermixing, virtually the entire population of the Dominican Republic and the majority of Cuba and Puerto Rico has at least some African ancestry, and the rest of the Caribbean is made up of countries and territories with overwhelming African heritage. And of course, everyone knows about Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Barbados. However, what about the on enclaves of the Caribbean outside of the Caribbean. The African descended peoples of the Caribbean have certainly created their own unique cultural blend over the past few hundred years, being a mix of many African, European, Native American, and even Asian sources. And what I'm referring to is the large pockets of Afro-Caribbean culture and heritage that lie outside of the island chain and instead on the mainland of the American continents. Afro-Caribbeans, mostly from Anglophone regions, have been migrating to other regions of the Americas for quite some time, ranging from Central and South America to even the good old USA. And I'm not talking about recent Caribbean-born immigrants to the United States, which there are plenty, but rather a well-established distinct regional people group that's developed their own culture and identity distinct from surrounding black Americans or other Afro-Caribbean people. There are currently 10 independent English-speaking Caribbean countries today, and around half that number are English-speaking territories that are still a part of the United Kingdom, and each country has a unique culture and history, and in some cases, multiple cultures, due to being spread out over multiple islands. As with literally every other island in the Caribbean, the Anglophone regions were initially colonized by Spain, split between the vice royalty of New Spain and Peru. However, gradually over a couple of centuries, Spain lost many of their Caribbean territories to other European powers, such as the Dutch, French, and English, and these various islands would trade hands many times over the centuries. The Caribbean was the hub for the transatlantic slave trade, with millions of Africans passing through the region headed to Colombia, Venezuela, the U.S., Mexico, and Central America. And although initially many of the British-owned Caribbean islands were majority white, mostly poor Irish indentured servants, the demographics quickly shifted as more Africans were brought to the islands, since they were seen as more acclimated for menial labor than the native Taino or Arawak peoples that inhabited the islands before. Unlike the United States, Africans greatly outnumbered the Europeans in almost all British-owned Caribbean islands, and the islands were rocked by various slave revolts with varying degrees of success, with slavery effectively being abolished in all British territories in the West Indies, including British Honduras, now known as Belize in Central America, and British Guyana in South America in 1833, although the practice would continue in the United States until 1865 and Brazil until 1888. The newly emancipated Africans of the Caribbean had already created their own Creole form of English, meaning that their dialect of English was heavily influenced by the original African languages spoken by their ancestors, and each island has their own Creole language that has been regionalized over the years. Although many might consider these Creole languages to be dialects of English, most linguists consider them to be an entirely separate language, and by simply listening to a Jamaican Patois speaker, it's easy to hear why. Obia, no, mama. Obia, man. I'm going to die. Everything going to be iry. Go over to Dr. Lady, mom. going to be fine now. Don't leave. Most English speakers would have an incredibly difficult time understanding spoken patois, although most native-born inhabitants of these islands can easily follow along, with most having grown up speaking both English and the creolized form for their entire lives. Caribbean English today is more reminiscent of British English than American English, despite being much closer to the United States, and contains many anachronisms and antiquated vernacular that are no longer widely used or known in the U.S. As I've pointed out before, although they're not located in the actual island chain that makes up the Caribbean, the fellow former British territories of Belize and Guyana are often considered to have a Caribbean culture and vibe to them. Interestingly, the many Anglo nations of the Caribbean were very close to becoming a single country at one point, with all British territories in the Caribbean besides the Bahamas, Bermuda, and the Virgin Islands forming the West Indies Federation, a union stretching from Trinidad to Jamaica, with the intent of combining into a united federation upon independence from the UK, although the large logistical problems mainly caused by distance fragmented the union. 
The backbone of the country of Belize was originally of Afro-Caribbean stock, with a culture similar to that of Jamaica and other Caribbean islands. However, since the middle of the 20th century, large-scale immigration of mestizos from the neighboring Central American countries and a high rate of emigration of the Afro-Belizean Creoles to the United States has completely altered the demographics of the country. Guyana is a very similar country with Afro-Caribbean origins, only located in South America next to Brazil, Venezuela, and other Guyana nations, epping Suriname and French Guyana, and also has large South Asian and mixed-race populations, but most people are aware of these two nations and are at least somewhat well-versed in their histories. What's truly astounding is the Anglophone Afro-Caribbean minorities that lie outside of these previously mentioned countries, and there are many examples of this throughout Latin America and Northern America dating back centuries. Central America has many groups of Afro-Caribbean origin outside of Belize with many diverse origins. Off the coast of Northern Honduras are the Bay Islands, the largest of which being Roatan, and after slavery was abolished in the British West Indies, a few thousand freed slaves from Jamaica and the Cayman Islands settled on Roatan, creating their own unique culture and identity known as the Caracols, numbering about 30,000 people today, and they still speak their own English Creole language. The Garifana, or Garnagua, are a multiracial group with a very fascinating history, having actually originated in the Lesser Antilles, when escaped slaves from shipwrecked vessels intermarried with the native Carib people of St. Vincent and other Caribbean islands. When the British took over the islands from the French in the early 1800s, they exiled many of the mixed-race offspring of the Garifuna to Central America, especially Roatan and Belize, and interestingly, despite being a mix of African, European, and Native American DNA today, the Garifuna of Central America still speak the Amerindian Garifuna language. The Mosquito people are a similar ethnic group in Central America, made up mostly of the descendants of Amerindians and escaped African slaves, and the former Mosquito Kingdom, located on the east coast of Honduras and Nicaragua, was actually a British protectorate until 1860, before being absorbed by these two Hispanic Central American countries. Interestingly, the Corn Islands, belonging to Nicaragua, and the neighboring archipelago of San Andres and Providencia, which actually belongs to Colombia, strangely enough, are actually populated mostly by Afro-Caribbeans known as Raizals, descended from slaves of former English settlers, and hence still speak English Creole to this day, and are very distinct from the rest of the Afro-Colombian population. The one Hispanic country outside of the Caribbean with the highest African concentration would without a doubt be Panama, where an estimated 40% of the population has at least some African ancestry, divided between the Mestizo and Mulatto populations, as well as a huge Afro-Caribbean diaspora from many areas of the former British West Indies. During the mid-1800s, thousands of workers from Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, and others came to Panama for work in the farms, fueled by unemployment and overpopulation in the Lesser Antilles and the need for labor in Panama, and this immigrant community reached a height during the building of the Panama Canal in the 1910s. Many of the laborers would return to their Caribbean homes, but many more brought wives and families with them, establishing Panama's own English-speaking Afro-Caribbean community that still exists to this day. Now this brings us to how a community of Afro-Caribbeans could be located in the heartland of the United States, and how they've managed to maintain a distinct cultural and ethnic identity without being absorbed into the larger black American community. Many of the slaves brought to the southern United States were either purchased from or channeled through the Caribbean, especially the Bahamas seeing its proximity to the mainland of the country, and many of the Africans picked up Creole language either in the Bahamas or in West African ports. By as early as the 1700s, many of the slaves, who, just like all other Americans of African descent, had come from many parts of Africa, and had begun to craft their own culture known as Gullah or Geechee, which has an emphasis on African traditions, and the Gullah language today is an English Creole which is most similar to Bahamian Creole from the neighboring Bahamas. Along the Gullah Coast today, stretching from North Carolina to Florida, out of the 3 million people that live in the area, perhaps no greater than 10% claim Gullah heritage. This amounts to around 300,000 people identifying as Gullah today, although it's estimated that around 100 to 200,000 live outside of this traditional region of settlement, moving to other parts of Georgia, Florida, or the Carolinas, including such prominent figures as the Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, former First Lady Michelle Obama, or even popular comedian Chris Rock, 
who, despite being raised in Brooklyn, New York, was actually born in Georgetown, South Carolina, and the heart of the Gullah Coast. Although the Gullah have been located in the United States for generations, they may or may not be considered to be a branch of Afro-Caribbean people because their culture and language is so similar to that located in the neighboring Bahamas to the south. Please let me know your thoughts on the Afro-Caribbean people and their migrant communities in Central, South, and Northern America. And as always, thanks for watching everyone. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.